It's Red Eye Radio. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley talk about everything from politics to social issues and news of the day. Whether you're up late or you're just starting your day, welcome to the show from the Uniden America Studios. This is Red Eye Radio. Hello and welcome. He is Gary McNamara. I'm Eric Harley. As we begin a Wednesday, Gary, how are you? I'm doing good. All right. <laughs> I was thinking this. What? You, you, I, I, the, um, uh, it, uh, I saw it when I woke up, and it was uh, that uh, the reports that Mark Cuban is uh, selling or, uh, you know, is, has actually sold or is in the process of selling the majority of his shares to the Adelson family. Right. He's going to the, gonna, the he, uh the casino family. Yeah, right. The 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 the, uh, the, the well known donors to conservatives and Republicans. <laughs> now Mark Cuban apparently uh keeps control of the basketball operations, which Op- is operations control he still he still right, has, right. Right. Yeah. Now my my thought would be because there's a lot of speculation out there, and they said until you talk to Cuban, you're not going to know. But the speculation itself is just, uh, I think, uh, is is really pretty interesting. They say that, you know, again, it's you know what the actual price will be, but we see we see the number of three point five billion, and uh, uh, um, and and some of the analysis I saw was well, that's actually pretty cheap. I for, thought for it the, was pretty cheap, for, pretty cheap, and they said, yeah. but that may be the case. That the Edelson family, because they got the the kids. Some of the, I think two of the kids are in their twenties, and it's like this is a long term. This is a long term investment. You can park the money there. You know that you know Cuban is. You know what's amazing? Mm. We're sixty five. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I saw yeah. that. And I'm like, yeah. No, because if yeah. he's sixty five, that means I'm. Oh, jeez. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're both young for your ages. Oh, thank you very much. What are you, 94? Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, come on, stop it. 92. <laughs> Guess my age, 97. Look. Oh, no, you're way off. <laughs> you know, when when uh, people know that I'm past uh, regular Social Security age, they say, you don't sound like it. Yeah, well, yeah. Dolly had technology work. On some parts of her body, I got all the technology for my vocal cords so I can sound like a, a young, immature kid. Yeah. Or and at least s- act like one. Or at least. <laughs> <laughs> I had my immaturity preserved. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I was the first thing that came to my mind was, wow, because I just saw that you didn't. The first story that came out didn't uh, say that Cuban was going to keep control of the basketball operations right, right, until yeah. he decides to give that up, which then, you know, the younger members of the Adelson family may be in, you know, I don't know, in their 40s, whatever, 30s or 40s. And then, yeah. you know, they would take it over. But before I saw that, I just saw they were buying it. And I went, wow, I can't wait for Magonite. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> She's 75, the matriarch of yes. the family. And, and she's 75. Uh I what I wondered if it, I, I wondered if if Cuban is looking to to maintain operational control of the Mavs so that he can kind of walk through existing contracts, kind of basically a a hand holding, if you will, with all the existing players and contracts right now, and then maybe pass it off later. That might be the case. I mean, this is all pure speculation. However, there was an interview that he did, that he talked about. He said he he envisioned the next Mavs arena being in the center of a hotel and casino. And he actually mentioned the Sands Company. Yes. Dallas, that, Dallas Morning that, News reported that yesterday also. Yeah, yes. in that conversation. There's been a push for those outside of Texas. There's been a push for years to get legal gambling in Texas. And it didn't get through the House uh, this last session. We have a part-time legislature, for those that don't know. We meet once every nine, ten years, whatever it takes. <laughs> we, don't, we, we don't rush it. And, and eh, 
it'll 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 come around. Um, and but there's you know there is the there's the conversations about casinos, legal gambling in Texas, and outside of the this. I don't. I still don't know what the state law on the sports gambling thing is because they vary so much. You know, with all the uh, different uh, fantasy leagues things that you can do. Um, but we don't have any casinos. Uh, we have native casinos about an hour north of here, uh, the DFW area, and ninety five percent of those nat- native casinos uh, revenues are from the DFW area. And then Shreveport also. Yes. And Shreveport is uh, about a, what, three-hour and something drive. I can make it two and a half. But the the thing... <laughs> now without getting a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the night. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> but it's... It, I, I don't... Because the first question would be, all right, Vegas need a basketball team? Well, Vegas would love a basketball team. I don't know that there's support for a basketball team in Vegas. I don't know that there's not. No, you you don't. I'm telling you right now, you don't take a franchise out of Dallas, Texas. That's the biggest question. You not take not any major the Vegas franchise. side of it, but you, if you take a basketball team out of Dallas, you'd be you'd be insane, right? With the growth potential here, because we've as got, you've seen it, yeah, we've got three. In this state, we've got the Rockets, we've got the Mavs, we've got the Spurs. And they're all a big deal with their fans, and they all have a strong base, those Spurs. And the entire thing, you know, you look at it, it then points to, okay, and then Cuban saying, all right, I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm not going to be on, uh, let's make a shark deal or whatever it is, uh, Shark Tank. He's resi- He's retiring after they said eighteen seasons. I didn't know it was still on. I didn't know that I, show was still. Yeah, on. I didn't know. I've n- I've never seen one episode. I of it, so. I see headlines from it. Yeah, but I don't. I don't watch the show. But he's leaving that show, and he said to spend more time with his family. Well, but then every, every time I go into the store and I see dude wipes, that's the only thing I know about. Oh, was Shark that Tank. from Shark Tank? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. I yeah. saw that display the other day, and yeah. I'm like, okay, all right. <laughs> And so I had a bunch of que- – I just know that, and I never got my questions answered that I had for myself, which – why do they call them dude wipes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can anybody use them? Yes. Or, or am I violating anybody's rights if I – But, yeah. Now, the, Jimmy Fallon, it's dude, not bud. Not bud. Not, not exactly. Bud. Yeah. Uh, right. And and you look at – you know, but you look at that dynamic, and it's interesting because is it the – could this be like a uh, – if if Cuban is is pushing, and I think he still supports, there's no reason to believe he doesn't, uh, legalizing gambling in Texas, and they're pushing for casinos, um, I don't know where you're going to put one. They'll find a place. But the idea of that is, is interesting, and could he then go into a partnership with that well, operation with and- Sands and, and, and that family and, uh, and, and bring legal – uh, gambling to uh, to Texas. Well, again, you don't see we don't see the uh, the the minutia of the contractual details, yeah. but uh, the the fact is, he made ten times his investment. If it's yeah. three point five billion, he's getting yeah. it's yeah. way over ten times because he yeah. paid two hundred eighty five million. So, yeah. if yeah. your plan is to go bigger and build a new arena, mm-hmm. and I thought about that because you look at the arena, you look at American Airlines Center, it's still new, but. This place is going so it, – it's growing so quickly when you mm-hmm, think about it. Mm-hmm. Now Fort, Fort Worth has their arena. Yeah. It's interesting because I was telling you yesterday the Trans-Siberian Orchestra for the first time is not playing AAC, American Airlines Center. They're yeah. playing the uh, the uh, Dickies Arena yeah. uh, in, yeah. in, in, in Fort Worth. Mm. And then you look north at the number of, of uh, you know, just in you know indoor – more minor league but still growing and growing and growing. Yeah. This place, if if you look at it – and I've been here 23 years, and over that 23 years, uh, we it, North Texas alone has grown two and a half million people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you don't yeah. have I, I don't know any metro place in the United States that has grown that quickly. I don't believe there is one. Yeah, I and, don't. Uh, yeah, I I would. 
Yeah, I would doubt that there would be right. one. I've never, I guess I've never so, thought about it, but yeah, it's it's massive. When So when you move up to, what are we, the fourth? I think we're the fourth. Are we four now? I okay. think we're four. I and think we, I think we passed For the San entire Francisco. metro area, by the way, a lot of people yeah. say, well, no, Dallas is smaller than, no, no, it's no, no. the metro the, area. The entire metro area, I believe right. we're, we're uh, number four. Right. Now, you don't move a major league franchise. You don't move an NBA, NHL, or NFL franchise. Yeah. <laughs> Social yeah. media was great. You think Jerry will be next? Yeah, right. <laughs> and it's like no. Yeah, stop the wishful thinking. <laughs> it's never. <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> you're Let's never. Just stop it. You're never. Sorry, Cowboys fans. You're never going to get it's, a real general manager. He's you, you even know after why, Jerry's gone. You know why Dolly Parton was there last weekend? You know why? Or last what Thursday? You yes. know why? Why? She's taught Jerry the secret. She's given him the secret, which means, Never as you just as you just mentioned, he's going to be around forever. <laughs> he's going to own the Cowboys. Forever. Just deal with it. Just I have, and you should too. No, I. It, it's just <clears throat> interesting looking at all of that because, for me, it's the business part of it. You know, the Sands when they moved in and 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 bought. The, the bought into their, you know, basically their ca- casino, started their casino empire. They started with $110 million. That's chump change it c- compared to mm-hmm. everything now. Yeah, I know. You know, and it's it's just interesting to see the movement of it and sports teams, too. You know, what people will spend their money on, what markets will and won't support this or that. Uh, we saw that, though, with. You know, the Chargers, we saw that with L.A. getting back into football. How's that working, L.A.? Um, you know, and, and that kind of thing of, you know, where where people and, and, and also it has to do with the migration, as you point out, this massive growth in a, in a city like this, you know, in a metro area like this in North Texas. I mean, it's huge. It is massive. And you look at the the future of it. What is it going mm-hmm. to be? This will be the future of industry. I'm convinced that Texas will be the future of it. Already has a ton of headquarters and 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 uh, corporations uh, relocating to this area, but it is. I believe there's going to be a ton of, and we're seeing it, tech stuff that is coming into closer to Austin. Um, but but Texas is going to be, I believe, uh, a, a massive massive uh, manufacturing. Uh, giant and and innovation giant in the future. Yeah, I agree. And and uh, you look at uh, North Texas, especially. You know, people look at Houston. They go, well, that's mostly oil. Yeah, you know, it's oil is the only thing Texas has. Mm-hmm. That isn't true. No, it isn't and, true. And especially when you see the diversification that you have in the Dallas Fort Worth area, and and so I would never move an existing franchise. Mm-hmm. If I'm the NBA, I'm looking at Vegas though, as as an expansion. So you're thinking uh, so some team could be an or, expansion, or, 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 an expansion expa- of the league, ex- expansion, yeah, okay. whatever, yeah. or yeah. you know, you look at some of the the uh, the, the smaller uh, yeah. teams. But if you look, you know, for example, they were, uh, you know, you look at uh, uh, Buffalo being the second smallest market uh, yeah. for uh, uh, you know for major league sports, yeah, and uh, you know the uh, the Bills, and it's going to be interesting to see because they're building a new stadium for the Bills. Uh, you know, they got. If Terry Pagula, Terry and Kim Pagula had not bought the Buffalo Bills, mm. they'd probably be gone. Yeah. If they hadn't yeah. brought this bought the Sabres, they'd probably be gone. Yeah. Pagula, the Pagulas are fans. You know, they didn't buy it. It's not yeah. like if Trump bought it or the Bon Jovi group came in, mm-hmm. they wanted just an NFL team, they'd move it anywhere. If right. Tr- yeah. <laughs> let's put it this way. If Trump actually bought the Buffalo Bills, do you think they'd still be in Buffalo? No. No. They'd be gone. You know, and the and the reason is they're they're fans and so but they got a tremendous amount of of taxpayer uh you know subsidies to build that stadium from New York. How long is that going to last? They'd be the Mar a Lago bills. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of taking them to the because every everybody speculated, remember during that he'll take another team to New York City? Nah, take them to Florida. Mar a Lago. The Mar a Lago Bills. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's just fascinating to me. Miami might have a say in that. Yeah, maybe. It's funny. Uh, Brian Regan said, if I, I would, 
if I had the money, I'd start another NBA franchise in Miami and call it the Humidity. <laughs> What's the name of your team? Well, it's not the Heat. It's the humidity. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, it was when when we were we were talking about the uh, the media looking at, uh, you know, the, the uh, Florida and Texas, and all of a sudden, like the last week, yeah, they've all jumped on it. Well, there are people from Texas and Florida that move elsewhere. Well, yeah. we know that. <laughs> yes. You know, it, it's it's you know what you end up at the end of the day, what the net difference is, right? And and it's huge. I was on YouTube yesterday. I don't know whether my phone picked up. Because we were talking about it on the air or whatever. Yeah. But the first thing when I go to YouTube yesterday is this realtor saying, I'm moving or I'm leaving Florida. I'm leaving. Mm -hmm. He goes, it's too dang hot. There's alligators. The traffic is horrible and everything else. Then finally he goes, and I'm going to Washington State. Well, not permanently. I'm just going there to hike with friends. He goes, <laughs> right, yeah, <laughs> and and I'll be back here having but fun with it. But yeah. I'm sitting there going, and I, but my first reaction was, is this part of the liberal campaign to say don't move right. to Florida and don't right. move to you yeah. know don't move to Texas and talking about you know the uh, you know property costs and 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 things like that. But um, I, I and, and hurricanes. It, and, I I forget where uh, which publication it was that was part of that too. Texas has the has the least freedoms of any state now that oh, okay i didn't read the article it was thanksgiving break and i thought okay i think i did save it but i'm guessing their take was something to the extent of you know that's it would be about abortion yeah because that's what they this is where they're going with it now you don't have that freedom you don't have these freedoms these liberal freedoms that, well, as they call actually, them. one of the things that they actually brought up was school choices are being debated right now. Right. Yeah, that's a big deal. It's, it's, it's an it article about deal. how yeah. many families took their kids and weren't enrolled in public schools during and after COVID. And many of them are homeschooled. Yeah. But they're talking it's about it's a big deal. right and, now, And it's being discussed right now, whether, you know, yeah. the whole school choice thing. Right. But uh, we'll see. Mm-hmm. All right. We got a great show ahead. Eight, six, six, 90 red eye. This report is brought to you by Shell Rotella. With advanced synthetic technology, is designed to help keep your rig running with more mileage and less maintenance. This preventative maintenance tip is brought to you by Hot Shot Secret, the country's number one fastest growing oil and additive company. If you've been driving a diesel any length of time, you know diesel fuel quality can be an issue. There are U.S. standards that diesel fuel is supposed to meet, like cetane number, lubricity, a.k.a. wear protection, deposit control. But oftentimes, the fuel at the pump falls short. Let's highlight diesel fuel's cetane number. In most states, the minimum a cetane number across the nation is between 42 and 45. And most modern engines are built and tuned to operate with the best cetane number closer to 50. If your truck has a low cetane rate of diesel, you'll often be able to tell. Cetane improves starting in the cold. Fuel does not burn as efficiently, which means more soot output, less power, and lower fuel economy. This is why a premium additive is needed to keep cetane numbers up. To keep the engine operating at its best while helping with cold starts, fuel economy, and DPF regeneration cycles. Add Hot Shot Secret EDT Plus Winter Defense, a 7-in-1 anti-gel fuel booster at every fill-up to keep cetane numbers in a premium range while also protecting you from gelling. Learn more about the science behind diesel fuel and Hot Shot Secret's EDT Plus Winter Defense at HotShotSecret.com. Lines open for your calls. 866-90-RED-EYE on Red Eye Radio. It's Red Eye Radio. He's Eric Carlin. I'm Gary McNamara. Coming up, uh, Congress actually voted on the House. Does Israel have a right to exist? Just uh, having that vote was just yeah. mind-boggling. Yeah. Uh, Bidenomics, we told you yesterday the whole thing that the White House fighting back against the whole thing of uh, the uh, the value meal being right. 16 bucks. Right. You yep. know, we're told it's 18 and a whole bunch more coming up.
You're listening to Red Eye Radio from the Uniden America Studios. It's Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Harley, and uh, and I'm Gary McNamara. You and I were just uh, uh, talking about uh, the uh, memorial service uh, yesterday or funeral. I'd, Whatever you call, it. I mean, there's gonna, I know there's gonna be a private ceremony later on today mm. um, for uh, Rosalind Carter, but um, uh, former first lady. But the 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 photos there, you know, yeah. showing Jimmy Carter. I mean, just heartbreaking when you yeah. see it. And I know immediately when I saw him, especially the different, because I watched a little bit of the video, but I was just swamped yesterday with stuff. Yeah. But the the still photos. Uh, there's just no way I couldn't think of my parents. Sure. You know, my, when the still photo of him with his mouth open. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I saw that with my mom the last three days that I was actually successfully communicated with my mom, who was mostly comatose at that point, mm. but she did react, you know, a, a couple of times. But when you're, um, when you lack in the, when you lack in the nutrition and as you get very close to death, your, your muscles relax and your mouth right. opens like that. Right, right. And that reminded me of that. And then I start thinking of my, I don't want to break up here on, on the radio, but it's mm. just, you know, it's just something you think of, you know, my, my dad being 97 and it just, you know, brought that not only compassion for what, you know, they're going through and their family is going through, but you do, you can't help but relate it you know, to yourself in the situation that you're in sure. when you, when I've got a father who's around, you know, uh, Jimmy Carter's age, a couple yeah. of years younger. Right. Uh, but you just, and you know, you know, my dad's doing, my dad's doing good. You got the pacemaker and everything else, mm. but you just, you know that, and you realize it all the time. It's just, at points it hits you. Right. It right, just right. hits you. And yeah. it, when I saw that, just like, boom, the emotion just yeah. you know, hit that dad's not going to get any younger. Right. None sure. of us are going to get any younger. Right. But it gets to that that one point where you just realize it. And so um, it was just it was it was so sad to see that. But the loyalty of being there, because I can't believe how long has he been in hospice now? Ten months. And this is and and the line that really got me was and I, I was aware of this, but that got me was this is his first outing since September. In other words, it's not the first time he's been out since he's been in hospice care. You know, that's the kind of spirit uh, of a person you can, uh, we can disagree all day with, with his politics or how he saw the world. But the drive of a person, the spirit of a person um, that's in a situation like that, uh, a 77-year marriage and and a, a a loyalty where they really were as a couple they were one they were and you know he there's there were um things that were read in fact a poem that was read i think amy and it's weird for us yes. who lived during yes. the carter presidency yes. to think of amy because we think of her as the you know the young girl uh but amy i think it was that read uh, some some notes that he had sent that uh, former President Carter had sent Rosalind Carter uh, when he was away on military service. And um, those types of things, because I think we it's just we all connect with those things. We all connect with that. But it's one of those stories that in today's society is is unique. I, you and I cover everything that's, you know, going on and and one of the things that had come up here recently and and one of the studies that I was reading was this right now a we're at a low in terms of marriages and childbirth in this nation so when you talk about a 77 year marriage wow it's it's incredible and his grandson saying that there was no way that he wasn't going to be there you know, uh, that he actually slept there at the Carter Center last night, the night before, and, um, and and was able to get some rest, but there was no way that he wasn't going to be there to honor his wife, you know. And those are the things that allow us to kind of step away from the, the 
well, what used to be the debate. There's really not a debate anymore. It's it's a ton of uh, chatter and and over the top stuff that's that's going and noise, frankly, that's that's going on politically. But when you when you see moments like that, you're reminded of the people. I never met the the former president. Uh, you and I talk about it all the time. We don't know these people. Uh, firsthand, I do know some people that uh, knew George W. Bush before he became president, but never met any of the people. When we talk about things on on this program, we talk about the ideas, and and we like to have the debates on the ideas. And it it actually is tragic that the debate has gone away, uh, uh, to a large extent. Um, but in moments like this, and you know, I would I would also say in moments when the current president's son Bo passed away. To me, that it was it was very tragic and sad watching a family, especially parents, outliving their mm-hmm. child, and and you look at at the situation, um, you know, right now with the Carters, and it's just one of those stories I I believe to be admired. Uh, it, it was I you know I think of if you're talking about presidents and love stories, Ron and Nancy Reagan, you could include there too. Um, especially in his later years, as Bu- she became the yeah. caretaker, the Bushes, the Bushes, certainly, uh-huh. and and that's what happens. You become the caretaker. You and I have both experienced that um, with our parents. Uh, it's going on to a certain extent right now. Uh, uh, in fact, with a number of my family members, and and you know, so you relate to that. You see it. Uh, and it, and you feel that loss for them. Well, and and the the one thing that it that it brings to me, as I said, you you feel compassion for them. But then, as you mentioned, you know, Amy Carter. When I saw the still picture of her, mm. I went because what I, in our I, mind, I have in in my mind, yeah. In, yeah. in in my mind, she's ten, right? Yeah, because right. I think yeah. she's like fifty six. She was born, I think, in sixty seven. Mm. Yeah. Something like that. And mm. so when he was president, she was 10, 11 years old. Yeah. I haven't seen a picture of Amy. Maybe I have, but I don't remember it. Right. And all of a sudden I see her and I'm all of a sudden you say, wow, I'm uh, <laughs> yeah. if she's if she's old, I'm old. <laughs> and I just in in my in my life. I have never, ever really spent more than. Five seconds thinking about my age Mm. you know thank god i've been i've been really 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 healthy Mm. and you know what i have which is you know metabolic syndrome which is type 2 diabetes and Mm. all that i can control that completely Mm -hmm. i can i still have the ability it's not like i have cancer Mm -hmm. that you can't control right type 2 diabetes i can control it i have to need a disciplined life but i can control it so even when I got that seven and a half years ago, it was like, okay, what do I got to do? Oh, I can control it? And the doctor said, well, yeah, you make the decision of whether you die or not. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, cool. I can mm-hmm. I can do that. Mm-hmm. And so I still didn't feel, because that hit me at, uh, uh, this was a 60 and a half when that hit. Yeah. You know, and so I, st- and I have still done, I was playing, I was still playing basketball, uh, you know, when I was 60. Yeah. And I was playing yeah. with younger people, yeah. too, all right. the time. Mm. And still doing the ice skating, mm-hmm. you know, things like that. And so, I mean, I was – and still today, I still do, still do a ton of athletic things, but the joints start going. But I really don't – I never think about age. I don't feel old. And as my dad said, neither do I, except physically, you know, mm. not – yeah. Me- mentally no right and so you really don't think about age i don't think my father really thought about age much right. until probably a couple of years ago yeah and all of a sudden you see something like that and all of a sudden the reality hits oh and you know it you know it in your head but you're i love the life that i live and it's like okay am i going to sit there and say <laughs> as we say on the air I'm doomed. It's all going to end. Oh no! Oh, we're or, doomed. Or 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 do you spend that time living life? But it's just those moments. And today was one of those moments. Uh, you know, seeing yeah. uh, Jimmy Carter there, that you just went, 
oh, I'm getting older. <laughs> and it's it's, just, it is a stark reminder. Yeah, it is. It and, really is. Uh, you know, it, it, again, also is so relatable for many of us who um, have our watched our parents' yeah. age. Uh, yeah. You know, I think my wife and I will be celebrating uh, 33 years of marriage. Uh, we've been together for 35 years. And to think of 77 I mean, that's that to me is a blessing, you know, and it's you can you can make all the marriage jokes and everything else. But it is a blessing uh, when it's great. And 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 when you think about that separation, you know, that that it's it really is one of those things that connects with so many people, you know, whether it's their parents or their own marriage or, uh, you know, uh, themselves or what whatever they may be going through. It is that that connection. You know, I, I always think of, uh, and, and I mentioned it on the air, that when my I had my 50th high school reunion this year that I went to. And, you know, I, I'm really, I find it really fascinating. And I'm glad I'm not like some of the people who, at the reunion, but they were saying the same thing at 40. High school was the, was the best years of my life. And, mm. you know, now it's, and I'm like, wow, that's pretty depressing. Because high school was not the best time of my life. The best time of my life is right now. But then you start, you know, and yesterday brought, you know, you know, just right, you, just that focus to you. And I thought about my dad, who's 97. Mm-hmm. All of his friends are dead. Mm. Yeah. But the family has come together. You know, I still, and I uh, said this, and I'm not, don't want to pat on the back. It's just, <laughs> I love the guy to death. But. I really talked to my mom more on the phone all the years. My father was always working, mm-hmm. you know, not that yeah. I didn't talk, but my mom, I talked to every single day on the phone. Always. Yes. And uh, when I, when I lived out of town, when my mom died, I had talked to my father probably, oh, uh, 30 out of 31 days. Yeah. And the, the, the other day we've tried to connect. Now, mm-hmm. some days we may only talk 15 minutes, whatever, mm-hmm. But you realize that the family, and there's a lot of families where it doesn't happen. And, you know, the, your, your uh, parents may be in a home. And physically they may not be good, but mentally they are. Mm-hmm. And nobody's around that they know. Yeah, right. Or, you know, the family visits right. once a week or mm-hmm. whatever. Mm-hmm. And my dad has constant family members all the time. Right. And And I think that's one thing after my mom died. My dad said it. He said, I realize we raised good kids because everybody's here and they're here yeah. all the time. You right. know, they're here all the time to support right. it. Right. And that made me feel good. But then it made me realize a lot of other people don't have that mm-hmm. and what it is to go through that. So, you know, most of the time, yeah, you, we, we focus on what we, we, we want to challenge life. Mm-hmm. We want to enjoy life. But yesterday was one of those moments where you just go, Oh boy. It is. It is that reminder. Yeah. Um, but but again, it. I think most all of us connect with that and and feel that sense of loss for them. Mm-hmm. And and we should. That means we care. That means we actually still care about life as a society. You know, because it's it's easy to look at at the noise right now that's going on and and the chaos. And how radical things have become and how radical people have become. But then you look at a society overall and, and, and it's part of our instinct for good to overpower that radical bad behavior eventually. And it will happen. I think we're starting to see it, in fact. Politically, will it happen right away? Don't know. But it will happen. Eight six six ninety red eye Get in touch with Red Eye Radio, toll free at 866-90-RED-EYE. It's Red Eye Radio. He's Eric Carley, and I'm Gary McNamara. A plethora of news out there. Uh, Hunter Biden and his testimony mm. saying, well, I'll testify, but only in public. And I love Comer. Hey, you can do both. <laughs> <laughs> 
we'll yeah. we'll get to uh, we'll we'll get to that in the analysis on on why he would want it to be public and not private, mm-hmm. which is pretty easy. Yeah, in private, you've got the investigators and the lawyers asking the question. To do it before Congress is where you have everybody have their five minutes and nothing gets accomplished. Yeah. You want them under oath with direct yep. questions yep. that the lawyers are actually asking. Right, right. Also, the uh, car dealers to uh, Biden, EVs aren't selling. Yeah, uh, there. Look, there was this. Uh, uh, there's this massive letter that these car dealers, and we knew it was headed this way because we can't sell them. They jumped on board early, but now that the OEMs are backing up, they're backing up, going, "Look, you got to let us out of it." Yep. Top of the hour news is brought to you by House Products. Visit HouseProducts.com. This is Red Eye Radio on Westwood One. Now, it's Red Eye Radio. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley talk about everything from politics to social issues and news of the day. Whether you're up late or you're just starting your day, welcome to the show. From the Uniden America Studios, this is Red Eye Radio. All across America and around the planet, we are Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Carley, and I'm Gary McNamara. Good morning. Well, we're almost done with November. <laughs> we are. December right around the corner. You know, I was just uh, thinking just one more thought that I had in my head when we were talking about uh, the uh, uh, Jimmy Carter yesterday and, mm-hmm. and seeing him at uh, uh, Rosalind Carter's uh funeral and i started thinking you know and we, we talked about you know how it brought us back to our parents our elderly parents and how it brought me back to my my dad and, and my mom's death and 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 all that and you know that realization which i guess is a little bit of you know instant terror that emotion that comes in oh we're all getting old mm. but the on the the flip side of it when i was younger and these were devastating deaths my my cousin Jimmy, we were 17 years old, seniors in high school. I mean, we were we weren't close before he got leukemia, mm. and he got leukemia. I think probably, mm, I, I think he was he wasn't supposed to live long, mm. uh, like two weeks. He ended up li- li- living like two years. Mm. So he died in, in our senior year, and and I got close to him because he was in my English class, mm. and. He was on the intercom so much of the time because he was undergoing chemotherapy. And when he died, it was just like the day before we went in, it's where they um, uh, replaced the, what was it, the white blood cells. Mm. So he was in a germ-proof room, mm. and he caught a cold. Oh. And it was like the next day, it's like my father had to tell me that he was, that he was gone. Mm. And that was absolutely devastating. My my uh, great-nephew, I have a, had a few little... Uh, talk with him uh, the other day. I think I mentioned it on the air the uh, the overall basketball coach of the basketball program that he's under at his high school died. Mm. You know, forty three, and you're very tough. When you're young, you just don't expect yeah, death. Right now, you do expect there is an expectation when you're young. If you're, you know, if you're, you know, uh, fifteen, sixteen years old, if your grandparents die, or if you have great grandparents, right. yeah. there is a, there's a sadness, but there is this thought that, you know, you're older, you die. Right. right. I mean, that's maybe that's how a lot of kids get through it. But when you're young, and somebody dies, that's just that is a terrifying moment. But when my cousin Jimmy died when we were 17, what came out of that? I mean, there's positives that come out of people dying. Because it makes you realize that life is finite and you can either go down the sewer of depression or say, I'm going to do what I want in life. And that helped me at that age. And then I had my radio partner when I worked in Fort Walton Beach, Pensacola. Uh, And uh, we were no longer radio partners. We were for a couple of years and then I moved on. But he got testicular cancer, the late Mark Stone. Uh, in Fort Walton Beach, and um, he was just, 
we used to all, all laugh because this guy was, he looked like a bodybuilder, long blonde hair, mm-hmm. you know, was the uh, 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 newsman, the news director mm-hmm. uh, of the radio station I worked at. And then at night sang in a rock band. Mm-hmm. And he was, like I said, built like a bodybuilder. We'd go on the beach and we'd all be like, remember the whole, the whole, those ads, the 98 pound weakling mm-hmm. being, you know, sand being kicked in your face mm-hmm. and, you know, you need to be working out. We used to joke about it all the time yeah. because it's like we be on the beat, and I was real thin. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. I look like I look like I was starving, and he's just mm-hmm. you know. And so we always used to have fun with him, and he died of testicular cancer, and he was twenty nine when he died. I think I would have been thirty one at that point. No, no, I was I was I was a few years older than him. I would have been thirty two or thirty three. That was devastating, absolutely devastating, because he was such a person that, you know, such great life. But that also, after the, you know, the the horror of something like that happening made me focus in on life. So death can do two things. I mean, it really can. It can, it can make you completely and totally depressed, and it can make you temporarily depressed and appreciate life and also motivate you as I did. So I don't want to make it seem like, because when I was talking about, you know, as our parents get older and we mm-hmm. get older, mm-hmm. you start thinking it because death can have, you know, it's horrible when it happens. I mean, mm-hmm. there is no upside to that particular moment, but afterwards it can make you realize that, all right, there are things that I wish to do in life. And I don't know if I would be where I am today, if those two deaths hadn't happened in my life. Mm whether the motivation, the realization that you need to get serious and do the things that you want to do in life. And it's going to be a lot of hard work and the reward may not come, but you'll regret it forever if you don't do what you want to do because they never got the opportunity to do what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And there is a part of me that when my cousin died and then when uh, my old radio partner died, that... um, Uh, you know, you just, you, you think to yourself, they didn't get to do it. I owe it to them to do my best. Mm -hmm. And those were all things that were very, you know, motivational to me. So I just wanted to throw that in because I didn't want people to say, oh, wow, Gary sounds, Gary sounds really bummed out by it. You know, you know, well, it's one of those things again, you know, we, it, it, when there is some, someone who has been and and I think Rosalind Carter was one of those for us that were 60s, 70s kids you know she was the first lady at one point we yeah. lived through that presidency um so you you grieve in that way it's somebody that was known uh but beyond that it's also the you see the relation uh to our families you know and and the grieving process is real and again it it reminds us or it should that we value life we grieve because we we value yeah. life. We celebrate people because we value life. We honor them when they're around, and and things happen, whether it's a birthday or job promotion or something like that. Uh, we should be happy for them, and in most cases, we are because we value life, which means you respect their time, their effort, everything that they put into something. In the case of a promotion or you celebrate with them if they're having a a birthday or whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is all about valuing life. You know, you know, when we in this whole conversation, we got into talking about uh, the memorial service for Rosalind Carter yesterday. But you were mentioning that, you know, just with, you know, everything that's going on, the insanity of what we cover every single day mm-hmm. and then family. Yeah. And getting together with family. And I started yeah. thinking about that because I just, you know, spent it with my family. And I'm talking about my immediate family, you know, my brother-in-law, uh, my nieces, my nephews. Yeah. Two who were adopted uh, from uh, from Columbia. My sister ad- adopted two wonderful human beings that uh, the, the best thing is because she adopted uh, uh, San Diego and Valentina. And they were, uh, this was 11, 12 years ago. So now, uh, you see, Valentina's in her uh, second year of college, Mm. and, um, you know, Sandy's in his, Sandy, Mm -hmm. short for Santiago, he's in his 20s. But to see them, 
and people see the pictures that I post on social media when we go to you know the uh, the, the breakfast place, Marty's in Clarence Center, New York, mm-hmm. and they always love showing. You know, the kids always love showing. You know, even though we're the old people, and that's the mm-hmm. one thing I. Mm-hmm. People, it's like well, I'm going to go out and sit in the car. You know, my great nephew will say once in a while, and I, "Oh yeah, that's right." You're with the old people, and I keep forgetting Mm -hmm. I'm the old people. Mm -hmm. But to realize, you know, you look at it, and, you know, for them, because they were like 12 and I think, or 11 and 9 when they were adopted, so they knew their family yeah, in Colombia. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they knew. And so they just going across the basically the world in their minds Mm -hmm. to a family they don't know. And to know, to know that you can feel it. Mm-hmm. That they know that we're their family, mm-hmm. and you know they're adopted is the coolest thing in the world. Yeah. But yeah. the one thing I want to point out is that the insanity, and I'm sure a lot of people listening right now experienced it Thanksgiving. The insanity, everything going on every day. Now we deal with it every single day. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's like because it's what our job is. Yeah. And so yeah. there's no way to get away from it, and you go through all the insanity and craziness, and all of a sudden you're there with your family, and everything's normal. Mm-hmm. You're not even talking about what's going on in the world. You're asking them how you do and what's going on. You're just and every single time I see my family, that's what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my immediate family. You know, what right. I mean? and and that's the most wonderful thing. So, yeah, I, to, and and you have to appreciate. I have to appreciate that I've had that my entire life. Yeah, and it started with all of my my grandparents, my aunts and uncles the vast majority now who are dead, mm. but that's where it started. And the fact that it's passed on to generations is exactly the way that I believe it's supposed to be. Yeah, it, it, it should be that way. And, and, you know, that's part of a, you know, the culture of a family, really. It's mm-hmm. not just traditions. It's, it's how a family uh, celebrates and, and communicates and, and, uh, and lives basically. And, and, because I was thinking about, you know, as as um, we head into who knows what uh, twenty four, <laughs> the political season looks like. As as we head into it, you know, I think we should be reminded of the fact that chaos can only burn for so long. The radicals can only burn on for so long. It might get worse before it gets better, but it will change because a society that values life, and we still are a society that values life, is one that will not let that chaos rule. I think we're starting to see it. I think, for the most part, the overwhelming majority of people, don't even Democrats, don't agree with that kind of radical behavior or point of view, and we're seeing that play out in 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 certain areas. But it will be there will be a point where it it's almost like that screaming child throwing a tantrum. At some point, they run out of energy and fall asleep. Yeah, but it is a little depressing to me where people say, oh, "I mean, it's just horrible out there." And my response is, "Well, there was the Civil War." <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> But exactly. Yeah. That gets me through the day. We're yeah. split night like never before. The country has never been this divided. Yeah. Well, there was the Civil War. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and we got through that. Right. So, <laughs> look, uh again, uh, who knows what it looks like ahead of us. But at yep. some point, this radical behavior uh will will burn itself out or will be defeated. All right. All this stuff coming up. Did you see? Now, look, you're looking for any sign of, of uh, <clears throat> any sign of hope. Mm-hmm. Democratic governor withdraws electric vehicle mandate in stunning blow to environmentalist. Yeah. <sighs> well, as we well, said, well, if if people aren't going to do it voluntarily, reality hitting the hypothetical is doing it for well, us. Well, this is it. <laughs> you know, if you'd said by the year 2155 or 2135 all EVs, that's one of those political things you can right. put into motion and go, okay, I don't have to worry about it. Nobody has to worry about it. None of us will be here by then. 
but 2035, and then all of a sudden the OEMs are going, yay, we're on board, about 12 months later. Uh, we <laughs> can't do this. <laughs> um, how about no? How about no? <laughs> and then the dealerships. Yes, we'll get to both these stories. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's just falling like dominoes in the last, what, two months? Yeah, really the last month. And you, it, when the you whole look at EV what the thing, OEMs right, the last were, month. were saying, and I, and I wonder how much of that was part of, you know, the, the whole thing with the union, you know, was, look, as long as these mandates are in place, you guys are screwed, right? And I wonder if working this the deal out with the unions was, all right, look, we're going to have to be profitable. The unions want us to be, the unions should want us to be profitable. But it was all in that same timeline. And now the dealerships are going, yeah, we can't sell them. They're brick. We can't sell them. I was reading a story about a guy who has a 2015 Tesla. Had to replace the battery. 19 grand. $19,000. His, his advice to fellow EV owners, put that money away that you're saving on oil changes and gas. Put it away for the battery replacement because you're going to need it. Yeah, you're right, though. Yeah. You know, things are changing yeah. because reality won't change. 86690-RED-EYE. Brought to you by FPPF, Fuel Power Max. Leased owner-operator should be aware of four common revenue myths, lest you fall into the trap of mistaking revenue for profit. Myth one, concentrate on increasing revenue because costs will take care of themselves. This is not true, as costs are fundamental to the profit equation and the area where owners exert the most control to improve. Myth two, more revenue per mile is the answer to all problems. Though carrier pay packages differ in structure, Revenue per mile really doesn't change much from company to company, but there can be a big difference in miles, overall gross revenue, reimbursements, and fees. Myth three, all you have to do to be successful is run a lot of miles. In reality, revenue is only half of the profit equation. Costs are the other half. It's possible to generate a lot of revenue, yet spend a dollar ten to make every dollar. Myth four, you can tell how well you're doing by the size of your settlement check. The settlement check is only a part of the success picture. Miles driven, loads hauled, conditions, mechanical problems, time off, and especially costs all have to be considered. Brought to you by Shell Rotella. With advanced synthetic technology is designed to help keep your rig running with more mileage and less maintenance. Lines open for your calls. 866-90-RED-EYE on Red Eye Radio. In Trent I Radio, he's Eric Carlin. I'm Gary McNamara. So story number one on EVs, Democratic uh, Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont is withdrawing his plan to mandate future electric vehicle purchases after his propo- after the proposal received bipartisan pushback from lawmakers on a key legislative panel. Mm. Lamont ultimately pulled the proposal just four months after unveiling it and characterizing it as a decisive action to meet our climate pollution reduction targets in July. Lamont unveiled a proposal tethering Connecticut's emission standards to those set in California, which mandates that every passenger vehicle sold is electric by 2035, the most aggressive target of its kind nationwide. Common sense has prevailed, Connecticut Senate Republican leader Kevin Kelly said in a statement, the governor's decision to withdraw the regulations is a reasoned approach to address the growing concerns raised by working and middle class families adopting adopting California's uh, key emission standards, which ban the sale of gas powered cars, is a substantial policy shift, uh, which must be decided by the General Assembly. There are too many questions regarding the capacity of our electric of our electric grid. Did I slur there? I haven't been drinking. Yeah. The cost and location of grid improvements and the negative impact on urban, rural, and working poor families, 
Kelly added, more than 90% of our pollution comes from outside the control of Connecticut. We need a national and international approach to improve our air quality. A state-by-state strategy will only prolong the attainment of cleaner air. So there you go. Yeah, um, look, it, it the mandates can't stand because there's not going to be a way to meet those mandates. It's impossible to meet the mandates that are in place right now. How long is it going to take for the mandate in California to change? I don't know. It could happen at the last minute. Newsom's not going to change anything as long as he's governor. That's not going to happen. He's going to wait till it, it, they'll wait until he's out out of office, or he'll let somebody else do it once he's out of office. But it's not going to happen anytime in the next couple of years. Get a word in edgewise. Eric Harley and Gary McNamara on Red Eye Radio. And he is Eric Harley and I'm Gary McNamara. Good morning. Download our Red Eye Radio app today and you can listen when and where you want. If you can't listen live overnight. All right. Now to the dealerships. We talked mm-hmm. about what happened with the Democratic uh, governor in uh, Connecticut. Not going to follow now uh, California's rules. Look. Uh, we told you this was going to happen. We're not geniuses. You don't need to be a genius. All you have to do is understand basic electronics and understand what a modern gasoline car can do that an electric vehicle cannot do. And the charging problems. And the, and the cost of it. But there's a couple of things in here. One in particular which shows how serious this is. And I'm reading here from the Wall Street Journal editorial page. And they have car dealers to Biden. EVs are not selling. Some 3,900 sellers ask for a reprieve from the sales mandate. And they started out, you can subsidize a buyer into the automobile showroom, but you can't make them buy. That's the word from almost 4,000 car dealerships across the country. Who on Tuesday wrote President Biden that their electric vehicles are piling up on uh, piling up unsold on their lots. They want relief. And they write, there are many excellent battery electric vehicles available to consumers to purchase, a dealer's write in their letter to to the president. But they add that electric vehicle demand today is not keeping up with the large influx of EVs arriving at our dealerships prompted by the current regulations. The EVs are stacking up on our lots. That's what they wrote. This is the thing that's really incredible here when you think about this. Mm. This shows you the seriousness of the problem. Now, dealers have a 103-day supply of EVs compared to 56 days for all cars. It takes them an average of 65 days to sell an EV, twice as long as for a gas-powered vehicle. EV sales are slowing even though manufacturers have slashed prices and increased discounts. And here's the point right here. Consumers paid an average of $50,683 for an EV in September compared to $65,000 a year ago. That's massive. And by the way, that means they're taking more of a loss. Oh, yeah, exactly. They're taking OEMs way more of a loss. are taking much more of a loss, which they're taking a loss at 65. We already know that. Which means what? Well, then you're going to have to bring up the cost of your the price of your gas-powered vehicles. Well, gasoline-powered vehicles have not come down in price. No. Think about that. 
not a, they've gone from 65,000 to 50,000 with the inflation that we've seen. Yeah. Gas powered vehicles aren't coming down in price and are still selling quick, a lot quicker than. Yeah. And there's a lot more of the gas powered vehicles being sold too, mm-hmm. by the way, mm-hmm. than EVs. Right. That's unbelievable. They've slashed prices an average of 15,000. Well, otherwise, it's a brick. It's not yeah. going to move. And so what you have here is dealerships saying, we need out from under the mandate because we can't keep up with, we right now can't sell the ones on our lot. We need you to slow the roll here so that we can take a breath. You're never going to catch up. Because the market is saturated for now. It just is. The average family is not going to go buy an EV. We're far from that. We're years from that. Well, I mean, it's everything that we said. And and I want to say this again because it's like you and I have said this for the longest time. Reality is what is now appearing. Mm -hmm. The hypothetical about what people would do. And this is across the board. This is on almost every single major issue that we face today. What the Democrats and Republicans were selling was hypotheticals. If you vote for us, this is what will happen down the road. Yeah, right. And so it was a hypothetical. No, people love EVs. We've said they won't love EVs. This is the problem. Here's what a regular vehicle can do. Here's what what an EV cannot do, as the automobile dealers explain right here. Uh, Most consumers aren't ready to make the change, in part, because EVs are too expensive. Many apartment renters also don't have garages for home charging, and public charging networks are spotty, with one in four not functional, according to one study. Hmm. Customers are also concerned about the loss of driving range in cold and hot weather, a legitimate concern, something that we have brought up many times before. Mm -hmm. This is what the auto dealers are saying. Some have long daily commutes and don't have the extra time to charge the battery. Truck buyers are especially put off by the dramatic loss of range when towing. The Ford Lightning is in on the list in the top 10 worst selling vehicles. The the backlash has just been horrible. Well, we said because that. It, you... What are you buying a what are you buying a truck for? Yep. The dealers want the administration to tap the brakes on its proposed tailpipe emission rules that would effectively mandate that EVs compromise two thirds of car sales by twenty thirty two. Uh, automakers might meet the government's quotas in left wing cities where Teslas are a political fashion statement, but price and convenience matter more elsewhere. A new study from the University of California. Uh, Berkeley's Energy Institute says there is a strong and enduring correlation between political ideology and U.S. EV adoption. Listen to this, Eric. About half of EVs registered as of last year were to the 10% most Democratic counties in the United States. Mm -hmm. Half. And about one-third to the top 5% Democratic counties. Mm -hmm. The study notes this suggests it may be harder than previously believed to reach high levels of U.S. adoption, U.S. EV adoption. No, it's not harder than previously to believe. You were only delusional. You were marketing propaganda. We weren't marketing propaganda when we told you how consumers would react. We told you the reality of what the consumer is dealing with right now. And we said, also warned the Biden administration that all their plans, you know, to keep spending and spending, that inflation would also impact people's choices when it came to a gas-powered car Mm -hmm. versus Mm -hmm. an EV. Yep. And then you look at the used EV market. It's plummeting. I mean, it's it's horrible right now. Uh, the used, the average used 
Tesla price dropped nine thousand dollars between twenty one and twenty twenty three. And the reason is nobody wants to deal with that inevitable of having to replace a battery or having to update a component, whatever it's going to be. It's going to cost you a lot of money. Why do that? Well, just go get a new one. Okay, then what are you going to do with all the old ones? As the dealers put it, quote, many people just want to make their own choice about what vehicle is right for them. And the, the, the way Wall, it's always been. Wall Street Journal. Imagine that. Yeah, exactly. It's the way it's always been. You, you know, if you're going to buy a truck, you're buying mm-hmm. a truck to do certain things in most cases. Look, we, as as we have said, this is the, and we're not the, uh, you know, we're not the only ones who have said this. This is the first time in American history because of government mandates that government, and this goes for our energy grid and electric vehicles, are basically pushing on to Americans a product that is less efficient and productive than the products that currently exist. This is doomed to failure. This is this is like in communist states where government central planning Never works. The marketplace works. Why aren't people buying EVs with the massive discounts and the subsidies from the government? Because they don't want one. There is no demand for it. There's only a very, very, very small demand. And as we see now, as Berkeley research shows... It's basically rich liberals that are buying yeah. in the most democratic counties. It's rich liberals that are buying the EVs. Yep. And tech geeks. Yep. You've saturated that market. As we said, what happened? It is it is an emotional buy. And there are other types of cars that are emotional buys. But it's usually in the high end. And you've hit that saturation. Because it comes down to practicality. You're going to have to put this thing into motion, and it's going to have to be there for you. Look, people can't remember to charge their phones. <laughs> and it's and, and, and what if something happens? All right, let's say you get your garage retrofitted. It's all set, and then something happens with the power. Now your car's not available to you. I mean, these are all the things that go through the mind of becoming an EV owner and never having owned one. You're going to have to make a sizable shift in that ownership, what it means to own and operate that vehicle. In a society that's been doing it efficiently with gasoline vehicles, And there's a gas station on every corner for decades. When you put a mandate into into place, you know, like this, that's an elitist attitude. I think the fact of the matter is, is that now you're seeing it. We knew we said this was coming. That at some point we said it, I think about a month ago, the dealerships already are screaming. And now officially nearly 4,000 of them signed on to this letter and said, we can't do this. This is insane. These are bricks. So now, what do you do with them? And what do you do with the used EVs? I think one of the other problems that's not being talked about is the fact that even on the far left, the far left is against EVs now Mm -hmm. because of the lithium mining that you're going to need to do it. And once it gets out... That well, we're not going to mine the lithium here. We're going to depend on China. Right. We're going to dispend. We're going to depend on dictators for our, our for <laughs> for our for our lithium mm-hmm. for uh, and the, cobalt. The cobalt mm-hmm. yeah, every, everything you need to build the batteries and mm-hmm. everything else. We're going to rely on China, mm-hmm. and we're going to rely on dictators that have oil rich companies to produce oil. 
uh, for us and not drill our own. Right. You can't sell that to independents and you can't sell that to a significant number of Democrats, including now liberal Democrats that don't want any lithium mining or any mining for the batteries. Right. And what are you going to do? Bury them out in West Texas like the wind turbine blades? Oh, man. Yep. Where are they going to go? Reality. Yep. That's why we even said conservative liberal. No. Reality versus delusion. Exactly. 86690 Red Eye. Coming up, more with Gary McNamara and Eric Harley. It's Red Eye Radio. It's Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Harley, and uh, and I'm Gary McNamara. So, yeah, it's it's really interesting that in the last month, this has all started to crumble down. Yeah. Maybe it was two months ago. Was it roughly two months ago where you had the CEOs of the OEMs write a letter yeah, yeah, and say, I, we I, can't do this? Yeah, I think it was. I think it was. Maybe uh, it was I, about two months ago, and then everything's gone downhill since that point. Well, and it's it's interesting looking at, you know, how this is all panning out, because the fact of the matter is, is that you can't you can't force the OEMs to make something that the people don't want. It's that simple. You'll force them out out of business. They can be gone. There's no way to make this happen, and there's no political will to throw more money at it, government money at it. I mean, on the left, there is all day long, but no. You're not going to get there with the, with the current makeup on Capitol Hill and in the White House. I don't know if you get there over the next few years. I really don't. Um, this is a problem for the Biden administration and Democrats. This is Red Eye Radio on Westwood. Now, it's Red Eye Radio. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley talk about everything from politics to social issues and news of the day. Whether you're up late or you're just starting your day, welcome to the show from the Uniden America Studios. This is is Red Eye Radio. All across America and around the world, we are Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Carley and I'm Gary McNamara. Good morning. Well, eh. we're almost to the end of November. December is almost here, even though for me it feels like we're in the middle of December. How is it not December <clears throat> yet? I know. I know. It's like, wow. Why aren't we there yet? All right. Now, what were you looking at? What article were you telling me about here during the break because we were talking about electric vehicles yeah there it man it seems like i'm just over the last few minutes have been bombarded all over again by uh by the uh by what's going on with evs but it was a big story with the dealerships um writing a letter to the the president nearly four thousand of them Here's the uh, story from National Review. How long does it take the federal government to build one electric vehicle charger? This is from Dominic Pino there at National Review. Longer than two years, apparently. <laughs> the <laughs> the seven point five billion in funding for electric vehicle chargers from the twenty twenty one bipartisan infrastructure law has so far yielded zero new chargers. According to Politico. And and according to Politico, they're a liberal publication. Yeah. So people don't know that. Odds are they will not be able to start powering Americans' vehicles until at least 2024, the story says. Well, 2024 is just over a month away. So I they did say at least 2024. But it's so interesting in in looking at at all of this and what you have to go through in order to 
even if you throw money at it, is it going to fix the problem? Well, no, government money isn't the fix. Because then you look at, all right, well, where where are we going to put the chargers? Um, You know, building out this network. In fact, the network, a national network of 500,000 electric vehicle chargers. Ooh, sounds great, right? It's a nightmare. And then beyond that, you have to look at the private investment because this is what the Biden administration will tell you. Well, we, we're doing this to, in, you know, to encourage private, the private sector to jump in and have investment and blah, 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 blah. Meanwhile, the private sector is at, at his door going, hey, dude, hey, 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 we're <laughs> drowning. Hey, hey, are you home? Are you home? Is he gone for the weekend again? He's gone for the weekend again? Think about all the things that are going on right now. American families are saying we're drowning with inflation. You're seeing uh, right now, in fact, the the trucking industry for a while now. Dude, we're underwater. Not that they, they expect a fix from this administration, but all the things that fall at the feet because of what this administration and the Democrats did you look at the the border, the border patrol, and we are we're drowning, and now the EV market, we're so far underwater. We don't know that we'll ever see daylight again. You know, after I read the Jonathan Turley uh, from the Hill dot com his um, article on uh, the, uh, the the situation with Disney, mm-hmm. and and he. Uh, his article was happy birthday, Adam Smith, the invisible hand just slapped Disney. Adam Smith, the uh, economist, uh, philosopher from the 1700s. Yeah. Who really was the one that recognized what capitalism is. Right. And uh, and uh, Turley relating the fact that, well, you're not giving the consumer what they want. You have to give the consumer what they want. If you're giving the consumer something that you want and they don't want. Right. (laughs) Right. You may please the people that agree with you, but you're going to lose money. So what is your goal? To please the people that think the same way as you or to please the consumer? Well, economics wins there. And so really the last 36 hours, I've just been immersed in. And I don't know why everywhere I look. There's something from from some late economist out there. Uh, th- this one got to me yesterday. I, I just I just want to read it because it uh, came from the uh, the, the famous uh, economic journalist uh, Henry Hazlitt, who worked for uh, the Wall Street Journal. Actually, worked for the Nation at one time. Mm. Wrote the book Economics in One Lesson, and one of the things that he really promoted was the fact, and you see it today, where. Uh, you know, you sit there and, and say, well, let's raise the minimum wage because it helps those people. Right. Yet you don't look at any of the consequences of raising it. You only focus on the people that will benefit and you ignore it and deny the fact that it will have any type of ripple effect anywhere else. And you can't do that. That's right. being disingenuous. Right. That's actually not looking at the entire economic equation, which you have to do. And so, you know, we have government says, we're going to do this. We're going to do this because it'll help this person. Well, what about the rep? No, there are no repercussions. It only helps this person and there's nothing else. For example, we don't talk about debt. Mm -hmm. We still don't talk enough about the fact of the debt that we have and the interest payments on the debt and how the spending has caused inflation. Because, see, there was no problem. Spend the money, spend the money, spend the money. If you don't spend the money and borrow from future generations, then you are an uncaring individual. Right. Well, that's emotion. Yeah. What about the reality of if you spend the money and you borrow the money, what happens? Well, we see it now, the massive inflation. Well, Democrats told you there was n- there was nothing to pay, that there was a free lunch. There's not a free lunch. Why? Because the Democrats refuse to look, and the liberals refuse to look, at what? Economics. How people respond to incentive. What happens when government policy is enacted, not just from those who benefit, but what is the overall economic effect? They simply say there isn't any. That's a lie. Mm -hmm. There always is. 
But it was funny because I just read this uh, thing, and it doesn't have anything to do with it, but it was uh, Henry Hazlitt who wrote uh, basically the whole the whole gospel of Karl Marx can be summed up in a single sentence. Because And I read this yesterday. It just it immersed me more in just economic philosophy yesterday. The whole gospel of Karl Marx can be summed up in a single sentence. Hate the man who is better off than you are. Never under any circumstances admit that his success may be due to his own efforts, to the productive contribution he has made to the whole community. Always attribute his success to the exploitation, the cheating, the more or less open robbery of others. Never under any circumstances admit that your own failure may be owing to your own weakness or that the failure of anyone else may be due to his own defects, his laziness, hang on one second here, I just lost, his laziness, incompetence, or stupidity. (laughs) And the, the thing about Hazlitt was he was known for being extremely blunt, but he was like, and I think Milton Friedman was a fan of his. And you notice, remember when Milton Friedman used to be on Phil Donahue all the time, and we used to, we played a long time ago, we would play, uh, a lot of his cuts, but the late Milton Friedman has it did the same thing. He made economics simple. He broke it down. Mm-hmm. He didn't make it where it was complicated. And Milton Friedman did the exact same thing. Yeah. And, right. and so, but you, you look at it across, everything is about economics and the, the problem that we have in this society and in society as general, in the world as general, is we still believe that we, and I, it's a tremendous arrogance that exists out there, which is proven over and over again to be false, that we can change economics. And yeah. you can't yeah. change economics. Yep. And there's a few things of economics. Economics is incentive, how people respond to incentive and or disincentive. And in economics, part of that is, okay, uh, I'm going to do what I feel is the best for my self-interest. Mm-hmm. Well, liberalism believes you can change that fundamental thought process in a person, and you can't. Now, what they will say is, if you are only concerned about your own self-interest, you're immoral. Well, that's completely false. Your self-interest can be completely and totally moral. It can be immoral. My self-interest is I want money right now. I'm going to steal. Mm-hmm. But then that isn't in your best self-interest because if somebody can steal, if you steal from somebody, somebody can steal from you. But if you also steal, you can end up in jail. So is that in your best self-interest to be a productive human being? No. That's and, a question for my lawyer. <laughs> talk, talk to my lawyer. But everything that we're dealing with is the arrogance of liberalism believing that we can control economics. You can distort an economy. You can manipulate the dollar. You can't change economics. Because you can't change and control people's interests, their self-interests. No, you can't. And that's what the left wants you to do. They they want to shout you into submission. And so you see it in EVs right now. You're going to see it on the grid in electricity. You're seeing it now as the, the survey showing in blue states where they're accelerating more you know, uh, the the whole solar and wind, mm-hmm. well, their prices are going up. Mm-hmm. In the red states that aren't doing it as much, their prices aren't as much. Right. And I think the difference in disparity between those that are slowest in going to alternative energy than those states that are really embracing it is your electricity price is double. Yeah, right. And and so, yeah, there are there are always consequences to. And what we were told is, no, electricity is going to be cheaper. And that's that's the lie that was told. But EV, you know, the grid, Disney colleges, because economic supplies to colleges, too. I was watching a uh, it just floated up in, in the algorithm on my YouTube. This young guy, 22 years old, entrepreneur. He's making over a million a year. And something he said in telling his story, he said, I knew I didn't want to go to college and I didn't want to go to, you know, this or that. I wanted to go into business for myself. Right out of high school, I knew that. 
And I thought to myself, is there a change actually talking to one of my grandchildren? Saying, this is what I've noticed in the difference between school going this long for the my chosen profession, and she's already chosen it, and then going this long. I'm eager to get experience. That's what I want. That's what, it, and I've calculated the difference, and going to school longer isn't going to help me unless I want to teach, and I don't want to teach. I want to be in practice in this profession. And I and I wonder if it is this, and, and this is what the universities right now, there's so much backlash. Because for the students, the overwhelming majority of students who don't want to be an activist, you just, you want to go to a school. You want to get an education. You're thinking that that's your best bet. Well, you're reconsidering because all the noise and then the agenda by those same universities. How's that going to serve you? How is that going to help you make a living? It doesn't, unless you're going to be a professional activist. And these are these are all the things that are right now converging right now with this economy. And here's, you know, here's the thing. I don't know how long inflation could be going on. Because you look at, at right now with the Fed, you know, tapping the brakes on on interest rates. And already talk of, yeah, maybe in late 24, bringing those, start bringing those interest rates down. The you one, do that, the inflation one, is going to go up. The one Fed governor said yesterday, expect in, uh, another interest rate increase. The, I believe there were, and, and most have believed there's going mm-hmm. to be one more, at least one more. But we should have been at a, at a, at a target rate much higher, not much higher, but, but at least a half a point higher than where we are right now in order to get ahead of the inflation. And I've never believed that Powell was serious about inflation, not serious enough. And so then what do you do? Well, it's that balancing game that they're trying to do with monetary policy, and, and they've tried to do for a long, long time. You know, Greenspan tried to do it. They, they've all tried to do it. They think there's this magic balance. But the fact of the matter is that the economy is going to, and, and here's what we see if, if and and more news uh, yesterday about a recession. More analysts coming out saying, "Look, we're probably going to see a bit of a run on the stock market. You know, maybe uh, for a month or two, but 2024 looks like a recession. It looks like a slowdown. Well, you get into a slowdown and you still have inflation, then you're going to be in in." bad territory that doesn't have a fix because you don't have the political balance to get it done. The Democrats don't have the House. The House or the GOP doesn't have the Senate and the White House. It'd be January of 25 before you can start Mm -hmm. implementing new policy. And that's going to be a problem. All of these things right now are at the feet of this president. And he put them there. 86690 Red Eye. Lines open for your calls. 86690 Red Eye on Red Eye Radio. It's Red Eye Radio. He's Eric Carley, and I'm Gary McNamara. So, uh, you know, with uh, with the uh, government lying to the American public, I call it lying because they tell Americans that they can, you know, that the the politicians can control the economy. Right. And and I'll just say it this way. Does anybody actually believe that Biden and AOC, because she came up with the Green New Deal, do you actually believe that they have the intelligence to control an economy? Or to direct an economy in the right way? No. Does anybody actually believe that? Because that is 
arrogance to the millionth degree. As you and I have always said, I couldn't run an economy. You couldn't run an economy. Nobody can run an economy. Nope. Well, you can run an economy if you're a dictator. You're not going to run a good economy. You can run it into the ground. Yeah. You can run into the ground, but you can't do it. But we, I'm sorry, but a significant portion of the, the United States, uh, the people of the United States are complete and total suckers. They buy anything. My dad said it, and I didn't believe him. Except when I was, EVs. <laughs> Apparently. Except, well, you, you, no, no, but they buy into the hypothetical until the reality hits. Well, no, that's it. That's how it got there politically. Yeah, that's how it gets there. That's, yeah. that's You buy into this idea, oh, look, and, and you know, there, you see so many people, look, I think we can do this. And, and because they see a YouTuber, uh, look, my off-grid cabin, don't mention my my penthouse suite in New York City, my off grid because I'm monetizing like crazy. My off grid cabin, it's all solar and wind. I get my water from the rain. That's all great and wonderful on a micro scale. Yeah, but you're talking about an infrastructure that has been in place for generations, and you want to go in in a couple of years and change it completely. By the way, when I uh, say suckers, I don't mean our listeners or a significant portion of people that call themselves conservative. Right. And I say that because not all people that say they're conservative are actually conservative. Right. Most (laughs) of our listeners are smart. Listen. Yes. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Program director getting a drink of water in the middle of the night. What what just happened on my station? What, What did he just actually say? to Red Eye Radio from the Uniden America Studios. And he's Eric Harley and I'm Gary McNamara. Welcome and good morning. So as we talk about economics, I just in in just the the broad stroker where where we're going here uh in uh, in the United States. When you see now the uh, the EV thing, we're seeing that it's starting to fail. Mm-hmm. And that's all about economics. Mm-hmm. Uh you've got government trying to push onto people what people don't want. You know, because back to the if you tie it together, the whole Disney thing, uh, it goes with colleges. Colleges aren't offering things that get people jobs. Right. You know, they're right. not offering what the demand actually is. All of this is about economics because it's all about, you know, people, you know, worried about their own, uh, you know, their own self-interest and incentive versus disincentive. That's what economics is. You can't change it. Politicians believe you they can. And they continually tell you that by manipulating the dollar. Or manipulating the economy that they're manipulating economics and they're not. Right. And so where do we go in the future here when you think about it? Because you see right now, you see with the Biden administration, the Biden administration's still selling the fact that, well, now they're selling the fact that prices are coming down. They're just outright gaslighting. Their gaslighting is a form of lying where everyone knows you're lying. Mm -hmm. You know you're lying. You know that the people listening to you know you're lying. (laughs) And everybody knows you're lying, and nobody will tell the emperor that they have no clothes. Mm-hmm. And that's basically what gaslighting is. Well, the opposition will. But that's what you saw this week. You saw massive gaslighting from the administration. The president stating that inflation has come down 65% yeah. while wages have gone up. That's the that's an outright lie. There is, yeah. you, And yeah. you notice nobody on the Democrat side said, oh, yeah, he's right on those numbers. Right, yeah. Because he's lying. Right. And so what were they doing before that, though? They kept telling you about the unemployment rate. Yeah. The unemployment rate's great. The people have jobs. Why aren't people happy? Well, we figured that out very easily. People aren't happy because one thing worse than a high unemployment rate, because if you have 10% unemployment, it still means 90% of the people that want work can find work. And when you're in that particular case, those 90% of people, 
that are working because there is a recession, prices tend not to go up as fast or they actually moderate. Mm -hmm. They're not. You don't have massive inflation. Mm -hmm. Why? Supply and demand. There's a greater supply of products out there because you have a number of people that are unemployed and aren't buying those products. What's actually worse, and that's why we said what's worse, and the Democrats just didn't get it, is that inflation is always worse because it affects everybody. And the worst thing is you want hopelessness? Hopelessness is not created by the fact that you're unemployed unless you're unemployed long term. But most people aren't. Hopelessness is when you have a job and it's not enough and the prices keep going up and you get a second job and prices still keep going up. That's the big deal. And you still are underwater. What do you do at that point? I can't get a third or fourth job. I'm maximizing everything. That's the problem with inflation that the Democrats never saw. This administration never saw. And they keep focusing on the jobs, the jobs, the jobs, the jobs. Well, now you've got Republicans because now you've, you know, when you, you talk about economics to sit there and say, I'm going to create more jobs. Everybody has a job who wants one right now. Mm -hmm. Every now you always have the, the churn rate, Mm -hmm. but basically everybody has a job who wants a job. Mm -hmm. So what's next? You know, what is Trump saying he would do if he became president? He'd put 10% tariffs on everything that comes into the country, which is going to raise prices. Why are you doing that? Well, because we want to increase manufacturing and increase jobs. You got the jobs. Mm -hmm. Jobs aren't a problem. Prices are a problem. And Trump's talking about, I'm going to raise, he's basically announcing to the American people, I'm going to raise prices another 10% immediately. Mm -hmm. He's not going to do that when he gets in, but that shows you, and I don't know, You know, to me, it shows, again, not understanding what the economic situation is right now. We're not going to have. Now, you talk about AI. All right. Now, if AI comes in and 40 percent of people lose their jobs, you can make that argument. Reading an article today saying. "Eh, That's being oversold on AI. AI is going to be an advanced automation. Right. It is going to be for a lot of industry. It's going to be the fix of not having the manpower. It's going to be what fills in the lack of manpower at the moment. There are a lot of industries right now, a number of industries that can't produce to their ability because they don't have the manpower. Right. And, and so you, uh, and the article was saying, well, in certain jobs, you may see that wages aren't going to go up as quick Mm -hmm. in certain jobs, but they didn't see, Uh, They didn't see this massive job loss. Now, understand that since the Industrial Revolution, which went from farming to industry, from the very, very beginning, all we've been told is that there would be massive job losses. And then when we were going from more of an industrial to an information economy or a more diversified economy, because we still have everything here. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was still being said. Remember, Obama said, the smartest man in the room, the smartest president ever, said one of the dumbest things ever when he talked about technology, and this was things like ATMs are taking away massive jobs. Remember that one? Yeah. He's completely clueless. Completely clueless. We have to stop thinking that just because somebody becomes president of the United States, as my father always said, you give them a title and they believe they get an infusion of brains and they don't. And we also have to stop applying Hollywood to everything with the whole AI thing. Listen to me. Come to me. Come with me if you want to live. This is the problem that 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 we have, I think, even with people who run companies. If you look at what's going on with with AI and how that will fold into industry. It will always be about creating efficiencies. Now, Hollywood, they're doomed. But Hollywood has been doomed by AI for a long time. The moment that they were able to, in Jurassic Park, 
get the the CGI down to where, oh my gosh, that looks like a ton of dinosaurs running through that field. When they could get it more realistic, well, there's your AI. CGI's been around for a long time. This is nothing new. AI is going to, and I have a friend who is a stuntman, and his part of Hollywood is being slowly phased out, they fear, because of AI, but that's also been the case for a long time, where you can fix things in the editing room. You can fix things in in post. You can add things in post. But the fact of the matter is, is that AI is likely going to be about the efficiencies with industry Mm -hmm. and creating, filling those gaps where labor is either gotten too expensive for whatever reason, most likely because 20 bucks an hour for flipping a burger isn't realistic or people just simply don't want to go do that kind of job anymore. Well, when you, when you look at it, when you look at the history, for example, of um, the economy of the United States, which, you know, before the industrial revolution, before you really got to 1850, 1860, where that kicked off, you know, for the next 50 years, the next 100 years, really, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where you saw that transformation, you went from basically 98%. Think about the number of farming jobs that were lost Mm -hmm. from 98% to probably, what is it now, 3 or 4% of the population works in farming? Right. So you talk about an entire industry. Well, people say an entire industry was destroyed. No, it wasn't. No. No. And so those people may work in farming, but who works making the chemicals, the machinery, mm-hmm. everything that's needed, you know, for the, you know, uh, for for the farming, everything, the millions of jobs that have been created. My point is, we've always been told that every massive leap in technology was going to destroy jobs. We've you know, heard was, that forever. Was, was going to destroy jobs across the board. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now they did destroy. You did certain jobs were destroyed, but every single time. More was created. So what we're seeing right now is, and the problem, it's not, it doesn't, again, we're not rocket scientists here. Mm. We're not Einsteins. It's just the observation of what happened. We don't have the birth rate. Right. We don't have the baby boom that happened post-World War II. And we don't have the influx of women that came into society, where now I believe there's more women working than men. Mm. Well, there's more women going to college than men. Hmm. I think there may be. I, let me, I'll check that. I'll make sure. I, I, I may be speaking on a turn, but I'll check that out here in the next couple of minutes to hmm. see what that is right now. Uh, but you have, I got in a conversation the other day with that one liberal gentleman who said, well, you know, women make more less than men. I go, no, they don't. Well, yeah, they don't. Well, they're not in the same profession. When you see college college women that are single before they have married or have babies, they make more than men, mm-hmm. you know, and so you throw that out. It's like, you know, there are certain there are certain things, and that's why you have to look at the entire equation. But right now, up until COVID, it's always been about jobs. Yeah. The question right. now is, do politicians have to shift? Is it about prices? Mm-hmm. Because if we're saying we want to create the jobs, and remember, even with Trump, it was tariffs, and Trump's still talking about Tariffs on every single country because we need to produce everything in the United States. We don't have the manpower to do it. Right. The workers aren't there. Right. So you can't do it. And so there's not a there's right now and for the foreseeable future, no political will to change the visa program. Exactly. There, that's there, not going right. to happen. And I will say this. Trump did say that when he had the we need to have we have, need to have lots of legal immigration into this country. But the public doesn't want it. Right. Why? Because of illegal immigration, that's understandable. He was telling that to Jim Acosta the day Jim Acosta was kicked right. out of the media room. So he was right there. But now when you sit there, when he said that a couple of weeks or about a, maybe a month ago, when Trump said that 10 percent tariff across the board to bring, keep the jobs and bring the jobs to the United States, you're like, what? You're not you're not. The last thing you want to do now, if you become president, is have an immediate 10 percent jump in all goods and services because you just put a tariff. Then, yeah, you and you had a, you're going to have a massive disruption right. to the trade routes. Exports would plummet. Right. And and so at that point, you have to look at it, yeah, because the retaliation would come in. Yep. And so you have to look at it. Where are we going to go economically? Because, again, 
Tariffs is another way of saying government can control an economy. Right. We can protect you. We can protect right. the producers. Encourage also the the idea, encourage more producers to just sprout, right? Creating this incentive for producers domestically to expand, the number of producers to expand. And it doesn't work that way, especially today. It may have worked at one time, but it doesn't work today. And the global trade routes would be, would and right now, you can't afford for exports to drop from the U.S. You want just the opposite. But it's the political promise. There's no chance he would get that through. Oh, no, no, that's not going to go through. It would it would never happen. But it's the fact that it's being sold to the American public as a political promise, as, as a political, uh, you know, as a political promise. Now, a lot of Democrats agree with that. A Bernie Sanders would agree with him. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you know, uh, in fact, on, Bernie on said that. it back yeah. in 2016. He said, I agree with Mr. Trump on the tariff thing. But but that's the, the but the point is everything's changed since covid. Mm-hmm. And that's if you're even trying to sell that. The American public isn't looking for jobs. They're looking for lower prices. Buying greater buying power. Greater buying power. And and so you've got the Democrats that want to spend more and the Republican lead candidates saying, We're going to increase prices if I become president. Right. He's not going to do it. It won't happen because the repercussions would be too, you know, to he may get he, I don't think he needed that to get elected to begin mm-hmm. with. It's not the same thing. But the whole thing, if I'm Trump, is getting prices down. Not increasing prices. Right. It's not a job situation right now right. in the United States. No, the promise has to be we're going to work every day to bring prices down and increase your buying power, expand the economy when we're in office. That's That has to be the promise. 866-90-RED-EYE. Get in touch with Red Eye Radio, toll free at 866-90-RED-EYE. It's Red Eye Radio. He's Eric Carlin. I'm Gary McMahon. I did a quick search here uh, because COVID, the participation rate of women fluctuated uh, in the uh, the workforce, but it's back to being half in profession, professional positions. Women have 56 hmm. percent of of the jobs in professional positions, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, right now. So uh, and that's what you don't have anymore. You don't have women coming in to the workforce as they did Post World War II, and you don't have the baby boom post World War II. In fact, you have the opposite. Right. And so we're going to be looking at what are politicians going to be talking about in an economy? Are they going to be, going to be talking about jobs? As the Democrats realize we can't sell that anymore. Right. It's not about jobs, it's about prices. Right. This is Red Eye Radio on Westwood One. Now, it's Red Eye Radio. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley talk about everything from politics to social issues and news of the day. Whether you're up late or you're just starting your day, welcome to the show from the Uniden America Studios. This is is Red Eye Radio. All across the USA and around the world, we are Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Carley, and I'm Gary McNamara. Hello. <laughs> Hi. How's everybody doing? We're still in November. Is this Groundhog Day or something? How's it not December yet? Another day. I'm tired of Novembering. I'm done with it. You're talking about EVs, and you're talking about the the one guy that story was out yesterday. The guy that had to replace the batteries nineteen thousand dollars. Nineteen thousand dollars. Let me see if I can bring that. I got that story up. Uh, Tesla driver hit with nineteen thousand dollar battery bill 
and his advice to other drivers who who uh, also operate EVs uh, is to stash that money you're saving on gas for the battery. Um, and this, by the way, comes, it's the claim of an individual to be clear. Okay, so, uh, but he was apparently showing uh, people an invoice or something online on this thread that he was on. And it's a 2015 Model S uh, that had 163,000 miles, and it was four months beyond its warranty. Hmm. And, you know, he said, look, put that that money you're saving, you're going to need to spend in a battery. We've all known that. You, we just didn't know what the cost would be. Well, you take that scenario and add it to the stories recently on used EVs and the fact that they're not selling. And the reason is, well, who wants to jump in? You want to jump into an, a used EV, not knowing when you're going to have to replace that battery? My point was, it makes me feel a lot better because on my almost 20 and a half year old vehicle with mm-hmm. 200, I thought it was 250. It's, it hasn't, I haven't been putting many miles on it. It's 244. Mm-hmm. I don't know why I thought it was 248, 249, closing mm-hmm. in on 250. Mm-hmm. I only put about 4, 000, 4,000 miles on it a year. Well, (laughs) new tires, and then I had a little problem with the power steering. They fixed it last week, and all of a sudden, the casing broke. Mm. I have to get a new (laughs) aftermarket power steering pump, and I'm like, is it time to dump the vehicle? Mm. And I decided to get the work done. It's a great vehicle. Yeah. I mean, if you've seen it, it doesn't look. When people see it, they're like, that's 20 years old. Mm. In fact, when I got my... uh, when I got my new vehicle, which is a 2017, I forgot. Somebody, it was, oh, I remember walking out with somebody out, out the door in the morning one morning. And it was, mm. I don't know who it was. It was a, uh, maybe it was, was Sherry working that day? I don't mm. know. But they walked out and I had my old vehicle. She goes, oh, that's your new vehicle? No, mm. that's a 2003. Yeah. <laughs> so it looks great and there's no rust in it. And I love having that extra vehicle. And, yeah, you sure. know, I never made a right. payment on it because I paid cash for it when I bought it mm-hmm. back in, in 2003. Now, Independent Bob believes that I have some type of loyalty towards the vehicle. That it's like, you're just loyal to things and you will never let them go. Well, it's like, it's, well no, I, I will. I, it, no, it's, it's okay as long as the loyalty is based in something. I mean, <laughs> I, I actually miss my old truck. And my brother-in-law scolds me every time he sees me, which is quite often. And he tells me, you know, we could have rebuilt the, you know, just and just had it around as a second vehicle for me. Now, I have, we have two vehicles. I don't need a second vehicle. But he's right. And I miss my old truck. It was a great truck, but it needed a lot of repair. And he said, man, that would have been nothing. We could have done that. But. If you have loyalty to a vehicle, it's often because, well, it lasted that long, right? Yeah. Which well, tells you what? It's reliable. I mean, it's it's a great vehicle. It's six cylinders. I, I really have had not The thing, I had fuel injectors, but since I did their fuel injector service, mm-hmm. my fuel injectors were covered in a warranty oh. even after my warranty was over. Mm-hmm. So the only thing I've really replaced on it early on, um, I think it was five years Five years in, I had to replace the alternator, that mm-hmm. one. But mm-hmm. then that's been fine since that point. Mm-hmm. The only other thing, and it always goes, is the spark coils. Mm-hmm. And they weren't that expensive, but and I have no problem with that thing yeah. at all. I mean, it's a right. wonderful vehicle, and I do it to run around town. I may take it once, you know, once a week to work or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I love it, and it sits up higher. And the one thing they don't talk about in vehicles, mm. they're lowering them. You're sitting oh, yeah. lower. Yeah. If you've yeah. ever noticed, get get into a sedan yeah. today. Oh no, no. And you're it's, like, yeah. you're like, what? The, why I, am I so it low? Drives me crazy. And, and and my wife and I talk about it. I don't think I could ever go back to driving a a sedan like full time. Well, they're lower to the ground than they yeah. were. Oh yeah. And even SUVs are. And it's all because mm. they need to get because of the government more gas mileage and they're talking about even the new EVs coming out they're actually going to make the, to to make the be- when they when they look, it was Toyota 
talking mm-hmm. about, you know, the new battery systems mm-hmm. that they are talking about will come sometime in the future, but they're mm-hmm. not sure when. Right, yeah. They're throwing out dates. And the analysis of it, and I forgot what engineering magazine I read, and they go, well, the batteries aren't the only thing. They're lowering the vehicles even more yeah. to the ground. Right, right. So there's less wind resistance. Right. And they also are creating uh, some weight efficiencies in how the battery is going to be integrated. And that's at mm-hmm. least that's what they're claiming. So what that tells you is they're making them lighter and lower to the ground. Which makes them, in my opinion, <laughs> well, I haven't done the actual safety survey on makes them a more dangerous vehicle to drive mm-hmm. if they're lighter and yeah right so much lower to the ground right but you can see in the suv my new one i get in it and when i get in the old one i'm like wow i'm sitting up really high this is nice yeah but it's a right. it's a great but i uh, you know that was a <laughs> that was a decision and when i when you said about the battery today i went well you know whatever's going to cost me and probably it will be with the new tires and replacing yeah. the whole thing. Right. I'm going to guess between fifteen hundred and two thousand. It's like well, that's the first thing I've done to it for really like four or five years. Well, when and, my brother-in-law was you know talking to me about, well, look, we could have rebuilt the whole powertrain, and I thought to myself, you know, it would be a few thousand dollars, but I wouldn't have minded doing that even for a second truck. You know, to keep a second mm-hmm. truck, to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, it probably would have been worth it. I just wasn't thinking about it at the time that I sold it. The other thing that made me feel better, where I went, okay, let's say this whole thing cost me, and I'm just throwing it up, eighteen hundred dollars. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or we'll say, yeah, yeah. well, seventeen hundred. Mm. <laughs> Remember, we did that story about a month ago. The average monthly price of a new car loan. Mm-hmm. Eight, oh, yeah. $800. Eight yeah. Yeah. I'm like, well, I never made a payment on this thing for 20 and a half years. This is like making two months payment. <laughs> well, no, somebody <laughs> made that comment. Like, of course. Uh, it was over the Thanksgiving break, and I forget who they were talking about. It was a family member that, and they were talking about somebody else. Well, you know, with a car payment of 850 and then insurance. And I'm like, oh, my God. It just hit me so hard. Eight. Hey. 50. And that's not like a 36 month loan. <laughs> like, what is it? What are they up to now? 90, 96? <laughs> the last car I partially financed was in 1980, I believe. Yeah. Uh, was it Pontiac? Was it a te- is it Tempo? Mm, could be, yeah. I can't think of the name of it, Pontiac. Yeah. And and I put a ton down, and I had a payment of $87 a month. Yeah. And it was like, oh, my God, $87 a month. Yeah. <laughs> no, I remember a car payment of 200 Yeah. And at the time, I was like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to have to go get another job, a third <laughs> job. And and so since then, even if I, I just saved money and bought any car, I, I got cash. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I just right. said, I'm not going to do that. Right. I just and, and so what I did was I just put money away that instead of payments, I was making my own payments to me without interest, you know, all the time saying, put this away for the next car. But most so. people can't do that. Most people now, yeah. have to finance. And right now, yeah. it's a horrible time to find. Well, yeah, but in in that time, remember that's the time that I was living in in a in apartments that had cockro- or cockroaches in the refrigerator yeah. and right. fire ants coming up through the f- floorboard. Yeah, and and very small, you know, two hundred square foot apartments. I mean, I wasn't living a life of luxury at well, all. And and you think about too the um, you know what's going on right now, the dynamics of the economy. Uh, There was a story, I don't know how much of it we talked about on the air, uh, but you and I were talking off the air the other day about the fact that older folks are moving in and have the advantage of buying a home. Yeah. If there is any kind of, you know, uh, bidding war, which we did see in our area for a while. I don't know to what extent that's going on right now. Um, But at one point, if you saw a house you liked, you better move on it. 
But the fact that with repeat home buyers, the average age of uh, the median age yeah. of a repeat home buyer is 58. And back in the early 80s, it was 31. That's crazy. Well, if it's 50, that's a repeat home buyer. Yeah. Well, if it's 58, that yeah. means exactly what you're saying. Half are yeah. over older than 58 and half right. are younger than 58. Which means but that's a much greater number of people yes. aren't actually taking out a large mortgage. Well, that's that's of that age group. Yeah. If, if right. you, yeah, if you look at, at, at those individuals that show up, this is what their point was, that older individuals right now in the housing market are the ones that have the upper hand because they have that equity from their home they just sold and they can carry with them and put a huge chunk down, if not finance the whole thing. Well, you know, there's the, you know, the the situation that we're in. When you talk about where interest rates are, uh, how hard it is to finance, because there's one thing, when, when you look at the price of, like, rent going up, that's that's problematic. But if you fix that, say, by moving in with a relative or taking on a roommate, then you still have transportation. You got to finance a car. And when you talk about the 850 bucks a month, man, I mean, I think of one of our first mortgages and it was 535 bucks a month. It was a house with a pool, 13,300 gallon gunite pool. Nice house. And that scared the daylights out of me, having a payment that big. I remember when, oh I, my when I paid off my mortgage, and I refinanced it, but when I but I paid it off in just a little over 15 years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My payment, you know, for my pool with the moat, <laughs> or excuse me, my home with the moat, which is the pool, $1,050 yeah. was my mortgage payment. And you look at the average rent in our area. It's skyrocketing. I know. It's unbelievable. I know. And all the major metro areas right now are experiencing that. We're experiencing it because of the high demand, people moving here. And other areas are experiencing the same thing uh, to some extent. But also, California has had that priced in for a long, long time because of regulation. The cost of government that's priced in to the cost of living. And... You look at the, I saw, uh, there's an article about how you have a number, more than half of the states right now have a contracting economy. It's more than half. It's either 26 or 27 states have a contracting economy. Which means it's a recession. It's a, that's a recession. It's, it's. Wow. And, wow. I didn't see that. And so if that is the case, well, then. Those that have been saying 24 is going to be a recession, they're right. Well, it's already now there. Now, they're saying they're, the they're talking about the big producing states like Texas and California. Their economies still expanding. But more than half are contracting. That's a problem. That's going to be because well, it, it it's it's growing. The number of states where the economy is contracting, is actually growing. And when it gets beyond half, it starts to become that tipping point. Now, it's not all equal because some states don't produce anywhere near a Texas or a California, to be clear. And those economies are expanding. Which will bring up my next point coming up, 86690-RED-EYE. Brought to you by Hotshot Secret. Hi, I'm Jen Loomis, a transport safety expert at J.J. Keller. And I'm here to share a tip on speed and space management. Due to safety concerns, many motor carriers have policies that limit or prohibit the use of cruise control. If your motor carrier does allow you to use cruise control, you should only use it in good driving conditions during daylight hours and on roads that have light traffic, few curves or hills, and a consistent speed limit. Never use cruise control when operating in adverse driving conditions, including wet, icy, or slippery roads. 
during rush hour in heavy traffic or on congested highways, at night or when you're tired or fatigued. During all of these driving scenarios, you want to be controlling and adjusting your speed as you drive instead of having to suddenly brake if you encounter an obstacle. In the case of a slippery road surface, you want to be able to slow your vehicle by not accelerating instead of using the brakes whenever possible. This tip was brought to you by J.J. Keller and Associates. Visit us at jjkeller.com. Coming up, more with Gary McNamara and Eric Harley. It's Red Eye Radio. It's Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Harley, and uh, I'm Gary McNamara. Well, that's really interesting looking at that article that you just uh, brought up, and I just read it from the Business Insider. I didn't see this yesterday. Markets are betting that the U.S. can avoid a recession, even as more than half of the 50 states are seeing their economy slow. Uh, Investors are optimistic about the economy, even as half now of U.S. states show signs of slowing down the number of states showing economic contraction in the three months to October jumped from 16 to 27. Now that means that doesn't say that. I don't know if that means that if their if their GDP of a state was 3%, they're down to 2% or whether they are actually, you know, contracting, whether they're actually, you know, losing or just losing percentage of growth i don't know what they mean by that right if they jumped into negative territory right right, right. and it says still seven of the ten most important states by gdp contribution are expanding uh and that would uh that would uh, be uh texas florida illinois california pennsylvania georgia and north carolina those are seven of the more ten critical states which means if we don't go into a recession it could be very few states that are keeping the nation afloat. Which, Those seven. Which which brings me to where we're going over the next 10 years if you're seeing this population shift. Right. You're still going to have companies in California and Illinois mm-hmm. in these, you know, big cities in, in, in Chicago, in Los Angeles, San Francisco. I mean, these population areas, uh, they're still going to be, they're still going to be they're going to have an economy. An economy doesn't disappear. Right. But you talk about the next 10 years. Are you going to want to do capital investment in California? Long-term capital investment. You're going to want to do it in Chicago? No. And so what I wonder is, is it going to be our economies and states? Are you going to see a much bigger difference in the GDP growth rates where the people are moving and companies are moving? And the answer you would think would be yes. Mm. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley taking your calls. One eight six six ninety Red Eye, and he's Eric Carlin. I'm Gary McNamara. Download our Red Eye Radio app today and listen when and where you want. If you can't listen live overnight, on one of our great radio stations. Uh, all right, so yeah, so I just I really wonder because everything had changed after COVID. Hmm. You know, companies now look and say, okay, what happens if something happens in California compared to a Texas, compared to a Florida, compared to Florida? You see the projections coming out. And again, you and I said when we looked at the 75-year projection of population growth in the United States, we said you're taking a lot of liberties there because you don't know. There are so many variables that could happen uh, in that time. Mm. You know, China, you know, may, you know, be our government by that point. Mm. Okay, just kidding. (laughs) A little bit of doom human there, doom humor. Mm. (laughs) Yeah. Um, uh, But. You know, it's we we, we uh, you know that that uh, projection that Texas would be a hundred million people in seventy five years, and that Dallas Fort Worth area would be thirty five million people. Up from what is it now seven, 
seven or eight. Yeah. Was it eight now? Closing on eight, I think. Million. Um, and so you're talking about. It will be eight by the time the show's over. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and so you, and you look at the projection for, for California and you say, um, okay, where's it, where's it going to be in, in 10 years? And if there is a shift, you and I know there's a shift. There's a shift post COVID yeah, of right. people's way of thinking and, and industry leaders way of thinking. Yeah. Because you're looking long term and you're saying California. Would you rather go to California? Or would, you, would you rather go to Texas? That would be the question. Would you rather do business in Illinois? Oh, by the way, did you see the mayor of Illinois blamed the mayor of Illinois? The <laughs> And I live there. The mayor of Chicago. You know who he blamed for the city's problems? Hmm. Republicans. Oh, okay. How? <laughs> by, I don't know. Not being in power? (laughs) It's it's Republicans' fault because Republicans aren't running Chicago. If they would just win more elections. (laughs) The other one that got to me yesterday, Black Lives Matter Rhode Island leader Mark Fisher said Tuesday on Fox that he's endorsing (laughs) former President Donald Trump in the 2024 presidential race. Yeah. Did somebody slip some acid in my coffee? <laughs> it's funny. I was just reading that article during the break. I had to reread it, actually. I was rereading it going, wait a minute. Hold on a second. Maybe something happened. Maybe maybe my brain had a glitch. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? But we've been asking the question because you see things, you know, and it's anecdotal. But it does make you wonder to what extent it's going on, right? Uh, so we can add this to the mix. When you have someone who's a diehard liberal, like the actor and now social media activist, I guess you, you could say, Michael Rappaport, who in a post recently said, sorry, but if it gets down to, and he's not a fan of Trump, but if it gets down to Biden or Trump, I'm voting Trump. And you look at where we are. Psychologically, people are wishing we were back in 2018. Psychologically, people are wishing we were back with that economy. We were back in the in the pre-COVID, you know, chaos, you know, with none of that on the table. Back to doing what we do as a nation, producing expanding the economy people are hoping for that now is it possible to turn this huge titanic around even trump and the gop if they took the white house the senate and kept the house i don't know but that's how people think in their mind i want to go back to that and i just have to wonder to what extent that's working with people who aren't talking about it who aren't saying anything and may just show up on election day and pull the lever for Trump. Here it is. uh, uh, And he was uh, on Fox with uh, Lawrence Jones uh, and Lawrence Jones said, uh, quote, this is my favorite story of the day because it identifies what I have seen in the barbershop. All the brothers for some reason right now are turning tides right now. I just wonder what is the big reason Fisher said, this is Black Lives Matter Rhode Island leader Mark Fisher. I think personally it's the duplicity of the Democrats, the hypocrisy. We are not stupid. The brothers are not stupid. We understand when someone is for us and when someone is not. It is obvious that the Democratic Party is not for us. Their policies actually strike at the heart of the black family and nuclear family. He's not wrong. He's not wrong. Uh, No, no, he's not wrong at all. I mean, look at where the you look at at the buying power for families. You look at the including black families where it was expanded, where job true job creation 
not bringing back the jobs that were shut down during COVID and calling that job creation true new job creation and wealth expansion and expanded buying power for minorities and middle class and everyday Americans. That happened. That was happening during the Trump years. Said he added a lot of people are misinformed. They don't understand because they don't educate themselves on Donald Trump as a person and his history. But if they do that, it's going to take, you know, leaders, educating leaders to get the word out. I think it will happen on its own. It will be organic because personally, I love the man. How could you, uh, as as like a real man, how could you not relate to someone like that? Hmm. All right. Well, we've said this for years. You know, we've said this for years. You could, you know, you the cities could do things differently. Oh, yeah. You know, the, yeah. The, the, yeah. The, the liberal areas could do same things uh, differently. And we've stated this for years, you and I, on the air, that uh, the Dem- the Democratic Party does not care about their minority constituency. They don't. They don't. They don't. Otherwise, you never would have done something like defund the police. Right. You would have never, ever suggested that when the polling showed that people in their own neighborhoods. Right. Supported the police. The polls showed that. Right. They were saying right. basically, well, we support it basically in the abstract. In other right. areas other areas where there are problems, but there's no problem in my neighborhood. Please don't defund the police in my neighborhood. That's what the polling showed immediately. Not a year later. It was right away. Again, people acting in their own self-interest. And so you look at, you know, post post covid and and this is the big question you know where is industry now going to want to where are they going to want to go actually the question is where are they going to want to do long term capital investment right are you going to do it in illinois and i'm just using them as as, as an i'm just using taking the most liberal states out there are you going right, to look at right. new york right. illinois California, right. right, or you're going to look at Texas, North Carolina, Georgia, Oklahoma, a lot of the you know Midwestern uh, cities. Now, the thing about the Midwestern uh, states that had some pretty good job growth earlier this year, or GDP growth earlier this year. The thing is, you have so many people, and you look at Texas, and there's so much room. I would say that one advantage that Texas has over Florida is that the population is younger Mm -hmm. and there's a lot more room. Yeah, right. And we have more uh, industry, more industry. Yeah. Yeah. Here in Texas. Right. Um, And especially the energy production in Texas. Right. Is massive. And much of the industry in in Florida uh, is about tourism. Mm-hmm. You know, and and also relocation as they're trying to accommodate everybody moving to the state. But I mean, it, it's it's so you look and also location. If you look at Texas being centrally located, uh, I thirty five is an artery, and mm-hmm. you know you look at that kind of you know uh, benefit and and leverage for productivity. But when you look at these states and you look at the breakdown of the states as, as we did earlier. Um, that showed, you know, and it's just a snapshot, but it shows the majority of states, more than half, now are in a contraction. Their economies are contracting, but you have seven of those 10 key states that are still expanding. Well, then you look at, as you mentioned, all right, where are you going to go? Where are you going to put your money? Because I have someone close to me who is working for a company and they were looking at expanding. And they looked at California. And one thing that this person did, they created, they said, okay, here's your cost of compliance alone. HR and payroll. That's all about compliance. And in states like California, New York, and Illinois, where the laws are are changing, but you you better be in compliance. 
Because if you're not, it will cost you. Then the cost of everything, all right? How do you attract talent? Well, the cost of living. You're going to have to pay them more just to live there. You're going to have to recruit people who have great experience to justify that. You want people with with experience uh, anyway, but in order to bring them there if they're not there already. You're going to have mm-hmm. to pay them more. And all of these things, you know, add up to the cost of government. We've talked about it uh, uh, to no end because it's important. And that long-term investment is stifled. In fact, that company that I was talking about decided to put the brakes on it and said, you know, maybe we don't do that right now. You know, when, when you look at uh, Texas, for example, this is pre-COVID. Remember the percentage of our GDP that was related to doing business with mexico remember Mm -hmm. the whole thing about Mm -hmm. products that you know that products that initially are that start manufacturing in mexico cross the border right like five times right you know back and forth between texas and mexico right in in the production uh uh, you know process there which gives you know texas that advantage i've always looked at the potential i'm from new york but i always looked at the potential of new york because the potential for population growth there, if they had what, uh, if, what I w- if they had a much more pro-growth, fewer you know less tax philosophy, mm-hmm. being the border state they are, yeah, with the number of border crossings that they have there. I look at Michigan. I look at Michigan the exact same way, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and Michigan has huge. You know, New York has huge population centers. Michigan has huge population centers. That's why we're taking, we're trying to do, when we do this, we're trying to take more apples to apples, you know, to compare, for example, uh, the uh, North Dakota economy to California. It's not going to be, it's just not going to be a fair comparison because it's completely different or compare Texas to a Vermont. You really can't do that because of the population center. But you see the massive we, – we've talked about one of the things, for example, with the number of people moving to Texas, that how is it going to – and these are all unanswered questions. We're, when we're asking the questions, we, we don't necessarily know what the answers may be because the future will let us know. Yeah, only time will tell. But if you do have massive, as we have been having here in Texas, massive immigration from other states here, well – that means there's going to be more of a labor force. Businesses are going to be tra- attracted there. Yeah. If you're losing people, yep. and you're losing from New York, for example, New York is losing people where I'm from, uh, the Buffalo area. I would love to see what the average age is compared to, for example, Dallas-Fort Worth. Hmm. It's got to be a lot older hmm. than it is. You don't have the number of people there to increase business a way that you wish to increase business even yeah. if you had even if you had a if you decided we're going to put in you know a lot of great you know pro growth policies and lower taxes by half or do whatever mm-hmm. you still don't ha- people would have to you know move there there aren't a ton of people there already there's a ton of people in texas mm-hmm. and there's uh, more coming in every day and the projection is that's going to continue so if you're a company you're going to say, okay, where are people moving to? That we have more likely we will have uh, an easier time with a job force there than we would in New York or Illinois mm-hmm. and and California. Right. And and that makes that cycle, you know, basically uh, it becomes something where at first it was about attracting that talent. And now you've got the talent right there. Already there. 866-90 Red Eye. We'll be right back with more Red Eye Radio with Eric Harley and Gary McNamara. This is Red Eye Radio on Westwood 